many U.S. towns and cities once outlawed homelessness through vagrancy statutes. Though these statutes are generally no longer around, many cities in recent years have passed a slew of laws which effectively criminalize homelessness. For example, most American cities now prohibit sitting on sidewalks. But these laws, just like the vagrancy laws, did not erase homelessness. From 18th century indentured servants left with nothing at the end of their contracts, to debtors abandoning stable work to flee creditors, to families deprived of needed income due to sickness or injury to a wage earner, to young men tramping for jobs in an industrializing economy where regular booms and busts made employment unstable, to the workers priced out of housing markets dominated by commercial real estate developers, investors, and gentrifiers, to climate refugees, to those who have lost everything in depressions and recessions, the capitalist economy has been creating vast homeless populations for centuries. But, past and present, the fortunate few and the precariously privileged many have always tried to render homelessness a moral issue about the perils of social permissiveness and individual failing that can only be fixed by punishing the poor. Let's explore this issue historically. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. One early account of homelessness in America comes from an 18th century indentured servant, William Morale, who in 1743 published a memoir of his experiences in British North America. He was trained in law, but saw his legal education interrupted by a financial crisis, the 1720 collapse of the South Sea bubble. The impoverishment that this financial crisis inflicted on his family compelled Morale to become an indentured servant. Indentured servitude was basically limited time slavery. In the case of British North America, a master would pay for a servant's passage over the Atlantic in exchange for a number of years of unpaid labor, usually five to seven. Sometimes at the end of the term, the servant would get freedom dues, such as land or money. But by the time Morale moved to Pennsylvania in the 1730s, most of the good lands had already been taken, and poor people comprised a larger number of arrivals. With growing inequality, people like Morale wielded little leverage to command favorable contracts, so he got nothing at the end of his term. Afterwards, Morale became a vagabond, tramping around looking for work. As he wrote in his memoir, I roamed about like a roving tartar for the convenience of grazing and for three weeks had no abiding place. In the nights, I was forced to skulk about in the extremity of the town where I lay in a hayloft. At one point, he describes becoming so thin that his ribs could be seen through his skin. He was basically dressed in rags and walked around barefoot. Morale's big problem, which might sound familiar today, is that he lacked any relevant connections in North America. An 18th century worker typically apprenticed himself in some trade and hoped that he could marry the master's daughter and inherit his business. If that didn't happen, he might spend his whole life as a wage laborer and never make enough to start his own family. That was the fate for about one out of every nine men in the mid-18th century British world. Morale survived by doing short-term jobs, kind of like gig work today, but that didn't afford him enough money to save. Eventually, he found stable employment and lodging with a blacksmith. However, he was forced to flee that auspicious situation when his creditors came after him. In the 18th century, a person could be thrown in jail for debt. If he couldn't get one of his friends, family, or acquaintances to pay off the debt, he could end up in jail indefinitely. Considering the insecurity of work, it wasn't uncommon for people like Morale to fall into debt and then to have to constantly flee their creditors. That's not exactly circumstances that beget stability. If we draw a key point from Morale's life, it was that he was compelled into indentured servitude because of the precarities of the economy, and because he was in a position with little power due to the inequalities of the mid-18th century economy, he ended up homeless after his period of indentured concluded. When he found a stable job in housing, it ended quickly because of the debt he accumulated while he was roaming for work. One thing that mitigated poverty for Morale was that in the 18th and early 19th century, it was common for employers to provide food and lodging for their employees. This changes as we move into the 19th century, but before we get to that, let's discuss more urban contexts of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. In cities like Baltimore and Philadelphia, a lot of workers lived on the very edge of subsistence. When work was short, workers would have to choose between buying clothes or meat. They could forego getting new clothes, but then they risk exposure and sickness, which would cost them even more money if they fell too sick to work. If they reduce their diet to just grains, they risk enervation. A lot of things could cause hardship. Injury, illness, a storm shutting down commerce, frozen roads, overproduction leading to high unemployment. 
any temporary reduction of household income portended imminent homelessness. To reduce their rent and heating burdens, families lived in multi-generational and multi-ethnic households, which meant that there was little room per person. In Baltimore, the average family enjoyed less than 200 square feet of living space. For perspective, the average size of a studio apartment today is 600 square feet. Families also survived hard times by selling their stuff, like kitchen wares, to pawn shops, and by taking on short-term credit. Short-term credit, however, came with the risk of debtor's prison. Of the 600 people who spent time in Baltimore's debt prisons in 1834, half owed less than $10. On the bright side, debtor's prison was one way to avoid homelessness. Under the most dire circumstances, the hard press turned to the almshouse. Supported with funds from wealthy individuals looking to bolster their reputations through charitable donations, the almshouse functioned as a hospital for the sick, an asylum for the mentally ill, a prison for convicted vagrants, a workhouse for the unemployed, a shelter for the homeless, and a repository for abandoned babies and older children. In 1820s and 30s Baltimore, anywhere from 400 to 600 people used the almshouse at any given time. The facility was usually overcrowded, with the disabled, the elderly, and the sick mingling with petty criminals and the mentally insane. In Philadelphia, it was common for women who bore bastard children to end up in the almshouse. By the early 19th century, however, the wealthy elite were pressuring the guardians of the poor to cut the cost of poor relief. This is because as the early 19th century economy grew, creating wealthier classes of bourgeoisie, the elite started subscribing to philosophies which attributed poverty to individual choices and moral failing, rather than the failure of economic superiors to take care of their inferiors. In other words, the rich wanted to justify their wealth in the context of growing inequality and poverty. Many asserted that the source of prostitution was sexual proclivity among women rather than economic desperation. Instead of offering refuge to poor mothers, the guardians of the poor increasingly chose to indenture poor or illegitimate children. Outside of cities, homelessness was uncommon because a large majority of people were self-employed or bound in relations of dependency. Those who worked for wages lived in the homes of their employers. Most African Americans were slaves or servants. Children and adolescents often were indentured or apprenticed at young ages. Women were subordinated to their fathers or husbands. A man may have ruled over his household like a king, though with that power came the responsibility to take care of his dependents. Changing economic conditions in the mid to late 19th century disrupt the state of society. Population growth put pressure on the land, leaving less opportunities for younger generations to start their own farms or shops. Steam technology, along with productivity-enhancing techniques, such as interchangeable parts and primitive assembly lines, led to mass production of cheaper and higher quality goods. As households began purchasing mass-produced goods, artisans and shopkeepers lost out and fell into wage labor. Some chose wage labor willingly. A lot of women did so because it gave them a source of income and independence outside of the control of their fathers and husbands. In some cases, government policies forced farmers from subsistence production to market production. Property taxes propelled many farmers into market production. To acquire money to pay property taxes, a household would have to shift from subsistence to making goods that they could sell in a market, or they could work for wages. This means farms become less self-sufficient, as well as more vulnerable to the fluctuations of the market. If, for example, a farmer borrowed money for seed and tools in order to grow cotton, and the price of cotton fell, he might not be able to make enough money to pay his debts and taxes, and thus end up losing his farm or falling into debt peonage. And closing the commons was another way to force people into market production. Many families relied on public forests to gather wood for heating and cooking, and public grasslands for their animals to graze. As these lands became private property, poorer families had to turn to markets to meet their needs, which means they needed to make money, which means they needed to produce for the market or work for wages. A growing interregional economy meant more internal migration of workers looking for jobs. As the populations of cities and towns fluctuated more and more, workers no longer lived in the same house as their bosses. As the worker and employer parts of towns segregate, the injunction that masters and employers look after the spiritual and physical well-being of their dependents disappeared. Now each individual was responsible for his own welfare. While there were always people who worked for wages to supplement household income, rare was it for individuals to rely solely on wage labor until after the Civil War. If a family relied solely on wage income, that meant there was no farm to fall back on during periods of high unemployment, which was common because the capitalist economy is prone to booms and busts. In the 1870s, there was a depression, 
in the 1880s a major recession, and another depression in the 1890s. Besides these longer, multi-year periods of economic underperformance, 20 to 30 percent of workers could expect to find themselves unemployed for several months even during good years. This economic instability helped create new homeless populations. Tramps were usually young men who traveled around the country working jobs in industries such as mining, logging, and fishing. They performed the essential labor of an industrializing economy, but as we are all too familiar with, were paid less than what they needed to live stable, sedentary lives. Between 1900 and 1920, three to four million men annually tramped about the U.S., holding as many as 20 million jobs. Most earned less than a dollar a day. A young man chose to tramp, often leaving behind a family for a variety of reasons. Some were pushed to look for work from home during a depression or recession. Some were wanted for crimes. Some shirked the burden of taking care of a family. The especially young maybe thought it would be adventurous, and some faced ethnic discrimination. The life of a tramp was hard. They slept in barns, shacks, and grain fields. They often went days without food, weeks without an adequate place to sleep, and months without satisfactory clothing. Climbing on board an ordinary freight or rattler was their most common means of transport, and this was incredibly dangerous. They suffocated in long tunnels by the gases of slow freights, died in train wrecks, and were decapitated or swept off by low trestles, walkways, and bridges. Some died after being trapped inside empty refrigerator cars. Jumping off moving trains led to cuts, bruises, sprains, and broken bones. Vagrancy statutes were widespread, but they failed to deter vagrancy. Instead, these laws gave license to policemen, private security, and career criminals to prey on the tramp population. Railroad authorities waged relentless war against them, and local police beat them and threw them in jail. Stick-up men targeted them, knowing they couldn't go to the police. In spite of these legally sanctioned oppressions, tramps managed to create their own cultures and communities. They spent most of their non-working time at gathering points known as harvest hotels or jungle camps, which were usually located in shady thickets, under bridges, on the outskirts of town, near railroad switching yards and junctions, or next to refuse dumps. They spoke their own slang, which only they understood, and these camps contained a large homosexual subculture. In fact, during the New Deal in the 1930s, the assumption behind programs such as the Civilian Conservation Corps was that homelessness and tramping created perversion for homosexual behavior. So programs such as the Civilian Conservation Corps were designed to try to prevent men from becoming tramps. For example, the CCC required every young man they employed to have an address so they would send money to families of the workers instead of the workers themselves. When jungle camps flooded, tramps sojourned to skid rows, such as the Misson District in San Francisco, where cheap lodging, inexpensive meals, lurid entertainment, booze, dope, sex, and companionship could be found. They stayed in flop houses, which were hot, smelly, noisy, and vermin infested. For entertainment, they visited public libraries, listened to soapbox speeches, or sat on park benches and read discarded newspapers. When they got desperate, they stole, but they tried to take items that wouldn't be missed. Sometimes they would eat a big meal at a restaurant and refuse to pay. They would be forced to wash dishes and sweep up. By the time they reached 40, most were worn out. Only one in five remained in the circuit after this age. The rest ended up as beggars or died young. Despite hardships, if a worker could save a little bit of money, he could buy a plot of land for a few hundred dollars and build a house on it. This changed as developers voraciously acquired valuable lands in the early 20th century. In Boomtown, Detroit, for instance, real estate developers bought most of the vacant land, carved them into narrow lots, and wrote into deeds that no house could be worth less than $2,000. This made housing unaffordable for a large majority of those who moved to Detroit. Most of those who could buy a house had to turn to banks, taking on three- to five-year loans which only covered half the mortgage. Borrowers generally took on multiple loans, and since they couldn't afford to pay down their mortgage in five years, they had to periodically refinance. This need to periodically refinance exacerbated racial tensions, as whites feared declining home values from black people moving into their neighborhoods would cause banks to deny their applications for refinancing, resulting in them losing their homes. Working-class whites responded by organizing neighborhood associations, which brandished the threat of mob violence to keep out black folk. With real estate and commercial developers amassing lands, Little space was left for workers, compelling many to live in overcrowded slums with broken windows, overflowed toilets, inadequate ventilation, 
holes in the roof, sodden walls with wind breaking through, and rusty kitchen water. Progressives of the early 20th century understandably feared that these run-down slums constituted major health and safety risks, so they passed laws creating more stringent building regulations. This led to safer housing, but not to more. And one legacy today might be that zoning laws have exacerbated the housing crisis. Conservatives seize upon these laws to absolve capitalism of the housing crisis, pointing especially to California, which they scapegoat for housing problems around the country. But as populous as California is, even if all of its residents suddenly fled, that shouldn't create the global, yes, global housing crisis that we are experiencing now. For global phenomenon, you need a global explanation. Only capitalism meets that criteria. We might start with the financial crisis of 2008 and work back from there. As countries in the 80s and 90s deregulated their finance sectors, finance companies created ever more complex debt instruments to sell overpriced houses to workers with stagnating wages. This eventually crashed the economy. The crash, which destroyed average household wealth and severely diminished labor power, exacerbated growing inequality. While some people have been fabulously doing well since, Vast segments of the population have suffered from stagnant, declining, subliving wages. A growing gap between rich and poor, along with greater risk aversion following the housing crash, has meant that builders have only been willing to make homes for the well-off. Here in the United States, this has manifested in a boom of McMansions. Certainly, housing regulations and zoning laws exacerbate this problem, but developers have always sought to create scarcities in housing and land in order to extort working populations. Such was the case with Boomtown Detroit, when developers accumulated all the vacant lots, and such is now the case with the advent of McMansions, investor-owned housing, and Airbnb. And the problem of zoning laws is neither conservative nor liberal. The quote from Dennis Prager, however, reflects the timeless conservative tactic of moralizing problems created by capitalist political economy. We are seeing this moralization of poverty among both liberals and conservatives. In California, the growing frequency and intensity of wildfires is creating large numbers of climate refugees. Initially, liberal towns such as Chico welcomed these refugees. Those who possessed wealth before the fires, such as those who were insured homeowners, were able to rebuild their lives. But those who were poor or struggling before the fires, such as those who were living paycheck to paycheck in trailers or apartments, were not able to rebuild their lives. As the numbers of unhoused populations swelled, from wildfires as well as from more mundane causes, such as increasingly unaffordable housing, a new narrative emerged. Wealthy residents formed a political action committee called Citizens for a Safe Chico and declared war on the unhoused population, painting them as violent, drug-addled vagrants and transients. They asserted that the city's unsheltered population suffer from toxic compassion, which created a culture of dependence and enabling. They sought to empower police departments and to criminalize the homeless. To be fair, lots of Chico residents opposed this moralization of poverty, supporting a Green New Deal instead. But considering that Chico went from a liberal Democrat-dominated city council to a Trump-Republican-dominated city council, it stands to reason that many Chico residents who once considered themselves liberal must have taken a hard right. It isn't a coincidence that homelessness is rising concomitantly with soaring rents, stagnating wages, and accelerating climate change. These are natural consequences of capitalism, the way it divides us and makes us seek personal refuges from the storms of capital at the expense of our fellow men and women. Many well-meaning people fall for this moralization because they want to protect their safe havens, because they don't want to grapple with the problems of the system that has granted them a little bit of privilege, because they want to feel certain that this could never happen to them, that the fault lies with the individuals rather than the capitalist system, because in a system and culture that glorifies competition, status, winning, and hierarchy, it is vogue to look down on the less fortunate, to treat them with either pity or disdain, where charity, welfare, or incarceration takes precedence over solidarity, compassion, and mutual aid. Thank you for watching this video. If you found value in it, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe.